Uh, in the early 1950s, a uh, physicist named Gerald Pearson took a piece of silicon and he dipped it into a molten hot bath containing lithium. Now, this is a bold move at the time. Um, but in doing so, he created the, uh, the world's first silicon PN junction, which has, uh, has now become a fundamental part of microchips, cell phones, computers, displays. Uh, but the silicon PN junction is also at the core of uh, the solar cell, the silicon solar cell. Um, it's really hard to understate, sorry, to overstate the importance of this moment, both as a uh, physical chemistry experiment, but also the, uh, the development that it kicked off. You know. uh, this moment kick-started a research project between Pearson and uh, another chemist and an engineer, all working at Bell Laboratories. Um, the, I wanted to say their names, Gerald Pearson, Daryl Schappen, and Calvin Fuller. So these scientists were all working at Bell Laboratories in New Jersey, and a few years later, in 1954, Bell Laboratories announced their invention. Now, this is an image used from the press release. Uh, you can see clearly a scientist holding one of their test strips of silicon. Um, this is sort of a momentous occasion, right? This was greeted with great excitement. Uh, I um, wanted to read a quote here, written by uh, the US News and World Report, titled, uh, Fuel Unlimited. They wrote that the strips may provide more power than all the world's coal, oil, and uranium. Engineers are dreaming of silicon strip powerhouses. Uh, the New York Times, Science Magazine, everyone greeted this announcement with tremendous excitement. And at the time, you know, it, it felt like this was the beginning of a movement. In uh, 1955, uh, Bell Laboratories started implementing these solar cells as a way to extend transmission line distances. Um, and as I said, this is the beginning of a movement, but it was a movement that would take over 50 years to develop. In the 1970s, we experienced the oil crisis, um, the price of gasoline striped, spiked dramatically, uh, and researchers began developing improved modules uh, with the goal of you know, freeing ourselves from this, uh, this constraint of having to consume other people's gasoline. President Jimmy Carter put solar cells on the roof of the White House. You can now buy pocket calculators with solar cells. Um, and my dad put a solar-powered water heater on the roof of his home. He was not a chemist, a physicist, or an engineer. Um, more recently, we've been experiencing the early effects of what is becoming a global climate change crisis. Um, the hurricanes and floods and droughts of increasing severity have forced us to question just how exactly we want to power our lives and our economy. Um, now, somewhere between now, which is a time when it feels like we're beginning to embrace this need for renewable energies, and 1954, we lost that sense of awe and excitement that we once held. Um, Instead, it's been replaced by a sense of fear of you know, how we could screw this up. And so today, I'd like to provide you guys with a little bit of a reason to think positively about solar cell, why I think it's awesome. Now, I uh, began my time, I'm, not, uh, I'm a little bit new to the field compared to my dad, but I've been spending the past 10 years working in the field of, of photovoltaics. I earned my PhD at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado. I spent four years at Columbia University uh, understanding the fundamental chemistry and physics of solar cells. Uh, and now today I work in Silicon Valley, making what I think are some of the best uh, solar cells in the world. Clearly I'm an advocate and a believer in solar energy. Now, I don't want to treat this as a criticism of the other forms of renewable energy or non-renewable energies. Um, in fact, I believe that much like a retirement account, a diverse energy resource portfolio is both uh, reliable and profitable. And so I'd like to make the argument um, today that you know, there are uh, many associated benefits to solar energy and to other energies. For example, I'll list a couple um, to non-solar energies. Uh, for example, uh, offshore wind farms can provide growth beds for marine ecosystems. Uh, hydroelectric dams have long been used to manage irrigation and flood control. Uh, hot springs, 
For example, this hot spring in Iceland can actually provide uh, a place for people to hang out and bathe themselves. You can see, if you look carefully in the background, this picture is, a, this is actually a geothermal power plant. Um, I'm also not blind to the challenges confronting solar cell. I, I think uh, storage remains an open challenge. And um, regardless, I'd like to tell you about a few things that I, that I think are particularly special. So first, uh, solar cells are literally as tough as the nails used to affix them to the roof. Solar modules are built uh, to withstand wind, rain, snow, sun, uh, even hailstorms. The fact that they have no moving parts means that the lifetime is measured in decades, and the maintenance requires a ladder and a garden hose. A typical solar cell degrades by about less than half a percent per year. And uh, many companies today, you can buy modules for, with uh, 25 or 30 year warranties. I'd like to take a moment for all of you to think about, is there any consumer product you can think of with, that comes with a 25 year warranty? If anyone has an idea. I, I still haven't thought of one. But think of the things that you thought of, right? I think solar belongs in that category. So I think a good word to describe this characteristic is resilience. And this is not the first time we've talked about resilience. Uh, I think it was, it was really eloquently described earlier today. And I think in a world where floods and hurricanes um, are challenging our environment, uh, resilience to the environment is, is really paramount. Second. Sunlight is everywhere. So this may seem kind of obvious at first, but often when I say this, people say, well, that's easy for you to say. You live in California. You know, you have all the sun. And, you know, I think, I think well, that's, that's true. There's a lot of sunlight in California. It's not, it's not as disuniform as you might think. So this is, I'm a scientist. I love data. This is a map of the uh, solar resource across the United States. And you can see, you know, Arizona, California, New Mexico certainly have an, an impressive energy resource. But if you compare the numbers, uh, California to here in Jackson, Mississippi, it's really only about 20% less sunlight that we get here than, than in, uh, in California. And if you compare that to, say, Maine or Michigan, which are some of the weakest solar resource parts of the United States, it's just another 20%. The comparison between Alaska and Arizona is only about a factor of two. So um, it really is everywhere. But I think that this graph, is, this plot is sort of hard to understand, at least for me, because I don't really know what a kilowatt hour is. I work in photovoltaics, and I don't really have a visceral understanding for what a kilowatt hour means. So what often is done at this stage is we draw a white box, and we say, look, if you fill this white box with solar panels, we could power the entire United States. Everything we need in terms of power and energy could come from that white box. And then you hope that nobody lives inside that box. But other than papering, you know, covering over somebody's home with, uh, with solar modules, I, I think that this is also difficult because this is an incomprehensibly large amount of area. Right? I, I don't think I've ever looked at that box, maybe from an airplane, but even then it's like, you know, so I'd like to simplify it, maybe reduce it to my own solar footprint or your own solar footprint, um, and think about it in terms of area you need to power a single family home. So for example, if we take Phoenix, Arizona, this is about how much area, so I should, I should caution, this graph, uh, the display here is about half the size of real life. So if you take this and you double it, this is about how much area of solar modules you would need to power a single family home in Arizona, here in Jackson, Mississippi, and in Portland, Maine. So these are, these are large amounts of area, but at the same time, you know, these are accessible amounts of area, right? Many of these uh, roof systems would fit on, a, on the roof of a single family home. Um, for those of you who live in an apartment, like I do, you can imagine finding a tract of land out in the country where you could install this much solar modules. So it really makes it an accessible uh, you know, dimension. So 
I like to think of this sort of um, in a slightly different way. Another way to consider this idea is you and I, we can both own a solar rooftop like that one, or we can own a solar farm out in the country, but none of us will ever own a nuclear reactor. I don't think any of us would ever own an oil rig or a windmill or a hydroelectric dam, for that matter, right? And I think in that way, solar is incredibly democratizing because we all have access to sunlight. And most importantly, many parts of the world most in need of democracy are the parts of the world that have the most access to sunlight. Finally, solar has for a long time been uh, liberating devices and people from the power outlet. So solar was first implemented in satellites, um, which power our communications and our GPS, which give us freedom to travel. Solar powers the International Space Station. All these things in outer space could not exist without solar cells. And our transport and our communications could not exist without solar cells. Um, I work for a company that uh, we help to put cells on solar airplanes so that they can fly for up to three months at a time. Back down here on Earth, solar modules give us the option to live on or off the grid. They give us the ability to contribute to the energy needs of our community. Uh, if you drive an electric car, they give you the choice to skip out on the gasoline line. They give you the option, the freedom from changes in the price of gasoline. So my three characteristics I'll summarize as resilience, democracy, and freedom. Now there's a reason I started with a picture from America's Georgia. I think that these three characteristics are also three founding principles of the United States. And I think it's really fitting that this technology was invented and developed in the United States of America. I think it really means a lot from a fundamental perspective. And uh, in a time when I think many of us are questioning what it means to be American and what it is that makes America great, um, I'd like to make the argument that solar is American and that solar is American as apple pie. Um, so for those of you considering what to do with your careers, um, you know, come join us. We're, our work has just begun. We're still looking for people to help us develop the technology, the policy, the social movement necessary to create a distributed renewable energy movement. Um, and for those of you considering what to do with your roof, put solar cells on them, it's the patriotic thing to do. Thank you. Thank you.